for sake of uh, YouTube. Today in financial markets microstructure, we are covering two somewhat distinct topics. So we are looking at liquidity and corporate policy and digital markets. So as usual, let us start with the quick recall of what we did last week. Last week, not that, this. Last week we looked at um, the value of liquidity. So before, before last week, we uh, just always looked at how liquidity makes market prices deviate from the fundamental value of the security. Last week, we uh, flipped that relationship and we investigated instead how does liquidity of a given stock affect its market valuation affect its um, possibly fundamental value. And we saw that this is a non-trivial effect, that this effect exists. So it, if, um, it exists because when investors are buying some kind of asset, they realize that they will not hold it forever. They will not actually realize the fundamental value of the security. They will not acquire it. Instead, they realize that probably at some point in the future, they will sell the security. And you can think of it as uh, the plan from the very beginning. Say investors are speculating and they say, I will buy this stock today. I will sell it in a year. It will raise 500%. That's a profit. So they plan to sell the stock from the very beginning. Alternatively, you can think that uh, selling the stock is not a plan but it is a real possibility so i do not buy the stock with the expectation of selling it at some given fixed point in time in the future but i realize that i might be willing to sell it because i need the money that is tied up in the stock or my total portfolio of assets has changed and so i no longer need this stock i am no its risk profile is no longer appealing to me and the bottom line is that whatever the explanation is, the investors anticipate that they will sell the stock at a price which will be below the fundamental value of the security um, at that time. And this discrepancy is due to limited liquidity. So they will have to incur some trading costs when they sell the security. And we looked at a few approaches to this problem to determining this price. Uh, we started with a very simple model uh, that encompasses kind of asset pricing theory. So we just took spread as fixed and we asked what would be the trading price given that fixed spread, given that fixed liquidity. We also took a memory trip down the memory lane and we recall that there is a model called CAPM, CAPM, Capital Asset Pricing Model. And we saw it, how would liquidity enter that particular model. And finally, the reason we went over time was we looked at a relatively big, a more comprehensive and more general equilibrium model of OTC trading. So the model of Duffy, Guardiano and Pedersen. And this was a search model in which limited liquidity arose due to some market power of the uh, dealers, of the market makers. And so in that model, we were determining price of the assets and spreads at the same time. So what we will move on today, what we'll move on to today uh, is, as I advertised, two different topics. So firstly, we will talk about the intersection of liquidity and corporate policy. So how does corporate policy interact with financial markets? Uh, we will look at how 
market liquidity and market organization affects opportunities to raise capital, and we will also look at ways in which it can affect company governance, corporate governance. And for the second half of today's lecture, or maybe for the last third, we will be talking a little bit about digital markets. So we will uh, use it... We will discuss how the digital, yeah, the, the digital revolution that happened in the world in the past 20, 30, 40 years has transformed the financial markets. And we will also use it to do a quick overview of the course to date. So we'll briefly go through all the topics that we did before now. And of course, we will touch a little bit on the topics of blockchain and cryptocurrency, because when you're doing financial markets and digital together, you cannot avoid this topic. So both of these were initially scheduled to take one whole lecture, but I realized that it's probably not worth it. So I compressed both of them to one lecture together. Um, yeah, and as we discussed last time around, we'll probably do auction models in the very last lecture that we have that is currently free in the schedule. So, financial markets and corporate policy. What brings them together? First, a quick intro. So, up to date, we have mostly been talking about secondary markets, right? In which um, In primary markets, the company issues stocks or bonds or some kind of other um, financial assets. It gets the money from doing so. And after that, investors just trade these financial assets with each other without really any um, influence or impact from the firm. So in looking at these secondary markets, we never really spoke how firms behave and we never really gave um, any reasons for the firms to actually care about these secondary markets. So today we will break down that independence a little bit. So we will talk about why can firms care about what happens in secondary markets. We will talk about how they can affect the market, secondary market through their actions. And we will also talk a little bit, we will use the concepts that we already have, and we will apply them to primary capital markets. So we will see what are the insights that we can get from there. And I guess it deserves a little explanation why we just looked at secondary markets and never spoke about these primary markets. Primary markets are in general less structured, I would say, so they are not as standardized. Even in secondary markets, we have a huge variety of different kind of market formats that you can have. You can have dealer markets, you can have order-driven markets you can, that uh, can be continuous auctions, that can be call auctions. There's a, there are a lot of different formats and it's already somewhat difficult to uh, speak about insights that generalize all of them. Primary markets are even worse in that respect. So you cannot really say about how these markets are organized because they are organized in such a variety of different ways. But, as I said, we can use some very general concepts to speak about it uh, in very, very general terms. And we'll start by doing exactly that. So, let us look at the connection between liquidity and firms' access to capital. If you remember, this was our actually main motivation for studying financial markets. We started our course by saying that uh, firms need financing to invest in profitable activities. If I have a good idea for an investment, but I don't have any money, and you, on the other hand, have the money, but nothing good to do with them at the moment, then you can invest in me and this will be a socially beneficial exchange. So I will pay you back with interest, I will earn some money for myself, I will produce some social surplus, hopefully. So we want that trade to happen. And that transaction happens in financial markets, so that's why we care about those. 
it is then kind of trivial that the more liquid are the markets, the smaller in the end is the cost of capitals. So the more efficient these markets are, the more efficient are these transactions. So it's easier to fund what needs to be funded, meaning that um, yeah, all the efficient transactions are, or many efficient transactions are, um, completed. While on the other hand, if markets were illiquid, it would cost me a lot of money to borrow from you. Just because of the huge sp spread, I would have to uh, pay you a lot in premium for being willing to invest in me. And so I would need to have a really, really good idea in order to go to financial markets seeking for funding. So in that case, if I have a solid idea, which is not fantastic, but it's good, it would be good to fund it, I will not go to the market, so, and this is the inefficient part. So market liquidity eases access to capital. A kind of... Um, another manifestation of this effect is that it's easier for the firm to progress through its life cycle and to grow. So don't care about these bullet points because I have this wonderful graph that I found somewhere. So this graph is from somewhere, again, I'm not really sure, but uh, it shows how sources of funding of a firm change across its lifetime. So on the horizontal axis, uh, is basically time or also size of the firm and all of these arrows here show what kind of possible capital sources you can employ at different uh, points in life of your firm. We are particularly interested in these blue uh, segments because they relate to capital markets rather than banks or internal resources. And so early to, to start up your project, your firm, you would need a funding from some business angel who fund projects at, a, at the earliest stages of their life. Then, once, once you're a bit on your feet, once you have uh, some kind of semblance of a product going, you can go for venture capital, and then eventually you can go to into IPO. So you can appeal to a wider demographic of all. Uh, of investors. The idea behind this graph is that ownership structure of the firm changes over time. So business angels sell your company to venture capital, so on. Uh, as your company grows, venture capital then exits as you go public. And the more liquid are the markets, the easier these uh, transitions go. So business angels would be more willing to invest in your company if they know that they will that they will have no problems offloading it when they want. And in this story we are talking about market liquidity in a very very broad sense, right? It's not a liquidity of your stock on any given exchange. Because you are not actually traded on an exchange until this very last point, until your IPO. Right? We are talking about general liquidity of the financial system. Of how easy it is to interact with, for business angels to interact with venture capital, uh, with, uh, with the rest of the capital market. So in connection to this transition of ownership, I have another story to tell you. So it's not about the growth of the firm, but it's uh, about this about this being with the right owner and this is a story of social network called Tumblr I guess most of you have heard about it I have heard about it never been much of a user but the thing about Tumblr is that before 2019 it was uh, quite a, a popular destination for various kinds of fan art. So pornography is one word, is one way to describe it, um, but this was not 
really the kind of porn you would find on Pornhub. This was mostly fan-armed, quite often erotic, of different characters from movies, video games, and so on. So all of those artists found their home on Tumblr. But in 2019, Tumblr was acquired by Verizon, an American internet service provider. And so what happened is that Verizon decided to ban all kinds of pornography on Tumblr. They thought it would be a wise decision, they would thought that this would make a service more friendly to all different kinds of audience who would not risk, uh, you know, stumbling onto uh, items that are not safe for work. This turned out to be not a wise decision. So we are just going through the newspaper headlines, you know, as, a, as an exposition device. So very soon after this decision was announced and implemented, Tumblr lost a third of its user base. So it went down from 520 million visits to 370 million visits across two months. And so at that point, Verizon decided they probably, maybe, possibly, they are not the best owner for this company. Maybe they are not in the best um, position to manage such a company as Tumblr. So they decided to find another buyer who would be more efficient with it. Who would be more efficient at um, managing this website. And so one bid apparently came from Pornhub, which recognized uh, the kind of value that Tumblr may have in its, in its old form. Um, yeah. But apparently this trade never happened, and uh, in the end, in, in the middle of 2019, uh, Tumblr got acquired by a company called Automatic with two T's for Matt. Uh, so this is the company which is largely responsible for WordPress, the blog platform. And so they did nothing with Tumblr, and I'm not really sure what position it's in these days, but that's a story about the uh, transition of ownership and why it might be good, might be beneficial, and why we need liquidity for it. I guess the story does not really talk about liquidity, but it says about the transition of ownership. Okay, moving on, but still sticking to the topic of access to capital and why it's important and how it interacts with market liquidity. So we already touched a little bit on the topic of IPOs and primary capital markets. And uh, I don't know if you've um, discussed how IPOs work in any of the other courses, but uh, if I recall correctly, I first the first and last time I heard about how IPOs work was actually in the financial markets course, which I realized today looked quite different from what I'm telling you. So um, to, to, to do that, I guess let me talk five minutes about how IPOs work for you to actually get some kind of real-world knowledge. So when a company wants to go public, when a company wants to uh, wants its shares to be traded on the stock exchange for the first time, what it does, it, it goes to an investment bank who will serve as an underwriter for this IPO. So then a lot of stuff happens behind the scenes, such as um, you know, the due diligence, uh, the company tries to put its financial reporting in shape um, to produce all of those financial reports that are actually required to be listed on the exchange. So. All that work happens, we don't really care about that. What happens on the sell side is the investment bank goes, approaches all the kinds of different investors who might be willing to buy stocks of this company, of this company. And so the investment bank asks them, would you like to buy some stock of this company? Would you like to make a bid? And so the investment bank actually forms some kind of a 
limit order book. So this process is called book building. And you can think of it as a limit order book where just one side is filled. So all the investment bank approaches different kinds of investors and asking them, asks them whether they would like to submit a limit order to buy some amount of stock at some price. And all the sell side is actually fulfilled by the investment bank. So then what happens is on the day the trading starts and this limit order book is um, kind of uh, used, cleared, I don't know. Uh, but everyone who signed up receives their shares at some kind of uniform price that is determined at the end. And once that happened, the market trading happens, the market trading begins. Meaning that um, everyone who did not get to sign up for uh, the IPO gets to try to buy the stock. Everyone who signed up but decided that they, 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 that they don't want to hold the stock gets to sell it. So your standard trading begins. And this leads us to our first Blitz quiz. So how do you think? What kind of prices um, how are how is the price produced by this IPO so how is the price at which this limit order book is cleared at the beginning of trade usually relate to the price that is established in the market subsequently say later in the same trading day so does IPO produce higher or lower price and is the price even higher or even lower for liquid or illiquid assets and I'll give you some time to think, so your 30 second seconds start. Crap, sorry. All right. I... Thank you. I forgot that I bound uh, mic mute to this... to the same button as uh, the timer. Yeah. Uh... Okay, so we have a full spectrum of answers. So someone was bound to be correct. And in this case it was Econ AM. I guess it's Andreas. Uh, and so the price at which the IPO concludes, at which um, the company sells its shares to the first public investors, is typically lower than the price that is established later in the trading day. And of course this price is even lower for assets that are illiquid, as compared to those that are relatively liquid. So this is the graph that um, shows this more or less, empirically. So it compares the degree of underpricing. How much lower is this first price compared to this subsequent market price? And it tries to um, map it as a, as a function of the effective spread 
that is established in the market. So I, I wanted to fix this formulation, but I forgot. Uh, we will not be saying, we will not be talking about the reasons of underpricing. There are many reasons for this, but I, I'm not sure if we want to tie liquidity to the fact that underpricing happens. But what we will talk about is this second part, that lower liquidity means more underpricing. So that's what this graph shows. Um, and the explanation that you can give here is probably uh, as follows. So investors are likely to anticipate subsequent liquidity to at least some extent, right? Uh, so they... Uh, yeah, I'm not even really sure. I guess the exchange on which the listing happens determines what what the liquidity will be. Size of the IPO might also matter. The amount of attention attracted to the IPO might also matter. So the investors are able to evaluate the future liquidity. And so they are uh, submitting lower bids to that initial book when they anticipate that the effective spread will be higher, that the IPO is likely to result in illiquid shares. And so this linear regression shows that there is a positive slope, which is what I exactly told you just now. Now, to be fair, you know, this scatter plot is all around the place, and you can use it to illustrate any kind of points as given by this classical uh, XKCD sketch. So if it's too small, you can find it here. Uh, so, yeah. It's not a, a, um, a conclusive evidence. It's not a conclusive evidence, this graph that I just showed you. Where is it? Here. That lower liquidity means more underpricing. But it's kind of a little bit, maybe, suggestive evidence. So one, uh, one argument in the pile. But yeah, you should take it with a grain of salt. Okay, so this was access to capital. What are other possible links between financial markets and corporate um, governance? Another point that we have in relation to this topic is that uh, comes from the fact that incentives of company owners and the managers that actually run it are quite often misaligned. So if your ownership and control are separated, if the company is not managed by the owners directly, like some old family company, uh, then you might have a wedge between what owners want and what managers actually do. So managers must be controlled. You must, you can alleviate uh, this misalignment of incentives through managing compensation schemes to some extent, but owners must be the ones who design these compensation schemes. Owners may or must be willing to intervene if the manager is doing some something very bad. Owners must be willing to replace the managers if, uh, if willing. So the question arises, are owners actually ready to do it? Are shareholders buying the stocks with uh, the readiness to improve company governance for the sake of long-term profit? Or are they doing the simply speculative thing and they are just buying the stocks expecting that the stocks will grow over some time and they are expecting to just sell it at a profit? I guess it did not close all sound-producing windows. Uh, yeah. So obviously, if we are in this first world, where investors are purely speculating, then managers are out of control. They can do anything, and so they, they are not really constrained by any kind of uh, control. So this is bad, right? They are not 
maximizing the value of the company. They are not working in shareholders' best interests. And this obviously destroys company value. Now, this problem has been identified a long, long time ago. So it's been outlined as long as uh, 90 years ago, in 1932. Keynes and um, Hicks both had opinions on this issue. And in particular, one thing that was outlined is that this problem is exacerbated for corporations that are uh, widely held, that have many small shareholders. Because if you have many small shareholders, no one really feels pivotal, no one really feels responsible for the company performance, for the company management. So, of course, there is there are annual shareholder meetings in which decisions can be made. There is a board of directors which is supposed to manage the CEOs in the shareholders' interests. But uh, all of these are quite imperfect. So there may be a need for concentrated ownership, for there to be a majority investor who is willing to improve the governance of the company. So let us suppose that such a large shareholders, such a large shareholder exists for some company, and this company is currently not managed very well. What is the choice that such a large investor has? On the one hand, the shareholder may seek to improve the governance, may seek to intervene in management decisions, replace the CEO or do something else, or they can just sell, which is called the Wall Street Walk, right? This is the US approach. If you don't like company management, just sell your stock. There is plenty more stock at the exchange, plenty other companies to choose from. And so this is the choice that we will focus on. Intervene or sell, fight or flight. And the point that I want to make here is that if the market is illiquid, the attractiveness of the second option to sell shares is lower than in a liquid market. So if we as regulators actually want uh, to want investors to intervene, want shareholders to uh, mess with the management, to in, in attempts to improve company governance, because this benefits the economy, this benefits uh, company management, then we actually want markets to be illiquid. We want to make it difficult to sell shares. Because this will promote corporate activism. Um, of course, this is a double-edged sword. And in illiquid stocks, exit is costly, which, as we just said, is good for activism. But at the same time, it is, of course, um, an illiquid market makes it less attractive for an activist investor to buy shares in the first place. So if I am a large shareholder who decides whether to enter this company, whether to buy a large uh, stock of shares of this company, and then try to improve the management, if the market is really illiquid, that makes it difficult for me to buy. And if I anticipate that it will be difficult to sell the shares at the very end, it also decreases my willingness to buy, to invest in the company and try to improve it. So, illiquidity is good and bad, and what we want to do in such a situation is to make liquidity kind of asymmetric, right? We want to make it easy to enter the company, to become a shareholder, to buy the stocks, but then we want to make it difficult to sell the stocks, ideally in ways that would be unanticipated by the investors, but um, if investors are rational, they would anticipate everything. But then, on the other hand, once again, maybe investors are not all so rational as we want them to be. And um, the argument that the book makes is that this kind of reasoning, this 
concern, this desire for the asymmetric liquidity underlies some of the regulation is one of the reasons that underlies regulation and um, it mentions US regulation but I believe same things are in place in many other countries so there are laws which say that if you are buying the stock then well if you do not hold a large uh, a large interest in the company then you're free to buy and sell stocks as you please but as you have accumulated some um, critical share of the company critical share of shares uh, then you must disclose your every step with this company's shares you must disclose if you're buying you must disclose if you're selling and so at that point I guess it kind of makes sense to say that you are an informed investor you know what actually happens in the company so uh, market will react very adversely to your announcements so this will make it difficult for you to sell the stock once you have it but then it's easy to accumulate the stock because you don't need to be transparent at that point um, so I would argue that there are of course many other good reasons that underlie this kind of regulation but uh, this might be one of them this might be one of the reasons okay let us move on to yet another uh, yet another connection between company governance and financial markets and this point is about the information so you can think that maybe maybe company managers maybe the CEO does not have all the best information available to him and maybe market has some extra information that they can share that it would be relevant for the managerial decisions and so if this is the case then the company can extract this information from the market can do effectively a survey of the market uh, by this following mechanism so they can first announce some kind of decision they will see how the stock market will react to this decision so if the stocks if the stock price goes up then this is probably a good decision if the stock price goes down then this is likely not a good decision and then after seeing this reaction the managers might can actually decide whether to follow through on the decision or to um, turn around and backtrack and say no no we were just kidding we are not actually doing that so the book outlines this in quite a bit of detail and I believe there might actually be a tiny toy model of this but I want to ask you so think of it as a survey so how do you think how often does the market has uh, have uh, superior information compared to the firm so how relevant is this channel and do it on a scale of one to five with one saying that the firm always knows better five market always knows better and i will not g even give you the countdown just post it in chat So we have one, two, two, three, gradually rising. Uh, do we have a four? No, it's not an option. So yeah, I. Uh, it's good to see that we kind of agree. I also think that it is really rarely that the market knows better than the firm. So if you think about the kind of uh, rational agents that fully and easily analyze all the information at their disposal, then strictly speaking the firm has more information at its disposal 
than the market, right? The market can only observe some general outcomes. The market maybe observes market reports, but the firm can observe all of this, plus they know uh, their own internal indicators. They know how much they sold, they know what was their revenue, they know what their margins are. So they have a lot more data to analyze. So I think uh, the firm usually has more information than the market. Now the only exception I can think of is uh, the firm's competitors. So the competitors might have their own private information and uh, I don't I don't think it counts as insider trading. If you're using kind of your private information to trade against other companies or bet on other companies, um, I might be wrong on this one, but I don't think it 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 counts. So in that case, it might be um, this channel might be relevant. The firm might use the stock price to try to learn from its competitors. But probably a better explanation is that. Uh, all the information is there, but it's very costly to analyze. So the firm decides to free ride on the market and make the market analyze everything, and um, uh, then just reap all the profits without doing all the analysis itself. But then, on the other hand, using this mechanism is really costly by itself, right? If we say that the companies care about this, their stock prices, they don't really want their stock prices taking this hit if they announce some silly decision. They don't want, um, yeah, they don't want that. The CEO who decides to do that might lose their job, and that's what happened actually in the case uh, that's covered in the book. So the book speaks about HP, I believe, Hewlett Packard. Uh, which at some point announced that they would be that they plan to completely abandon the market of computer hardware and focus exclusively on computer software and so the market decided it was not a good move their stock price dropped but then the CEO pretty much lost their job over it so this is probably not a good channel to use if you are a CEO but keep, in, keep it in mind for very dire circumstances. Um, I guess, yeah, another, another case, just a quick, a quick case study, a quick story on this topic that I don't think I told anywhere else in the course. Uh, it might actually be the case that the market is very good at find, finding out the information. One popular story for this is the crash of the American Space Shuttle Challenger. I believe it was, uh, in 1985. So it went down at the start. And um, NASA took, I think, four months to investigate the crash, to find out who was responsible for this, which of the uh, suppliers was responsible for this. And at the same time, it took the stock market about 30 minutes after the crash to determine which of the suppliers was guilty. So I think 30 minutes after the crash, uh, stocks of one of the suppliers went pretty down, so they took quite a big hit. Um, yeah, NASA took four months to arrive at the same conclusions. So that's one popular story you can tell for market having superior information to any given firm. But, uh, you know, in this story, I would say the standards of proof are a little different. So the market, for the market, it would be enough uh, to suspect something. Uh, NASA would have to be really certain to formally accuse someone. Okay, so we are not yet done with company governance and financial markets with the connection between the two. We have a couple more aspects to cover, but let us take a quick break here and we will continue that after the break and we will cover the financial markets after that so grab a drink think of whether you have any questions so far and I will see you in five minutes <laughs> 